Welcome everybody to what in theory is our first live recording. You get to view the behind the scenes, the how the sausages are made, how the goals are conceded in the last minute to teams that couldn't even beat Switzerland. David is basking in the glory of the magnificent 1-0 win over Scotland. But yes. that will be the only mention of it. We're not going to mention it at all on the actual show. Are we, David? You're not going to lord over me in the slightest. I've Maybe. thought about that exactly zero times since it happened. Yeah. So you're safe with me. <laughs> I'm safe. I, I'm, in a, I'm in, a safe, in, in a safe place with David. But we are yes. going to record a show and you get to see all the behind the scenes. If you wish to participate, just jump into the chat, send us a message. Uh, but this is how we do this. So we're going to do our usual countdown, gentlemen, before we start for the real podcast. So on the count of three, three, two, one. Three, two, one. Clap along at home now. Three, two, one. I think it's important that we tell our audience why we do this, and it's it's basically a morale boost. We give ourselves <laughs> ourselves an applause right at the start to know what we are fighting for here. It's, it's just a boost. It's like those South Korean factories where they have like a company song. I think a blog to watch needs a company song, something that has that kind of beat to it. Yeah. The, yeah, it, the, the <laughs> kind of endless clapping. I think that's yes. I think that's the way to do it. So anyway, for those who are now tuned into the podcast, you're missing out on watching this being live recorded on YouTube. So if you want to see that happen and take part in all of the shows live, you can tune in around about this time, seven thirty ish on a Tuesday morning, to a blog to watch weekly live and take part. Ariel was so scared about this happening and him dropping the ball that he is in fact not here this week. So it's just David and Ripley. Good morning, David. How are you? Good morning. Very well. Very well. Very well. Good. How are you? I'm not bad. Not bad. You know, disappointed to be out of the Euros, but not unexpectedly so. But there we go. I, and <laughs> collectively, I mean, the chances of a Scotsman and a Hungarian recording a podcast together when we lost and both managed to knock ourselves out of the Euros at the same time, you know, there's, there's some there's some probability at play there, some big numbers at play there, unlike goal difference. Well, actually, our goal difference was quite large, thanks to Germany. Absolutely true. Uh, Ripley, how much care and attention are you paying to the Euros? Um, when I have a moment, I, I, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a fan of the sport, but um, it. You know, being an American, it's just sort of like, choose a team to root for this time. And, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's kind of like the World Cup. You know, there's no point in rooting for your home country. So you just want to make it interesting. And you just want to you just want to see some good games regardless of who wins. It, it is true that America are not in this uh, competition this time. But we've, we we've imported all of our like famous players. Like who is like the homegrown American soccer hero? Like Landon Donovan. Like well, I was gonna say Landon not. Donovan. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> now, is Landon Donovan like in his late fifties now or something? I don't know. I have no idea. You know, playing. like I, I you could totally walk by that guy at a grocery store and not have any idea that he was the, <laughs> he was the face of American football for a while. For a while, good stuff. Anyway, let's uh, talk about some watches. It's been an interesting week this week. Lots of diversity uh, in what's going on. But let's start with a uh, grinding gears from David. Again, touching into a reasonably regular theme we've been having about, I don't know, everything getting worse. Just the inevitable demise of all things of Western civilization. Yes. And this is, David, your grinding gears, the quiet demise of craftsmanship and performance in the affordable luxury segment. Give us, a, give us a bit of background as to, you know, where performance and competitions had their place within the watch world actually not that long ago. Yeah, I mean, competition is not so much, uh, a little bit less so, but even after, even, I don't know, like 10, 15 years ago, uh, I think it, uh, the last um, observatory, um, not championship, but um, competition happened. And then Group of 4C won everything to an extent where basically <laughs> there was <laughs> almost no point in, in, uh, in, in arranging another one. But actually, sadly enough, that that's not why they ended those observatory competitions, but Rather because, and we are talking about a historic 
competition. And it's, it, this has been going on for decades or maybe over 100 years or something like that at various different observatories. But the, the last one standing, uh, they pulled the plug on it because all the brands who have um, submitted their watches for this uh, very elaborate, extremely thorough um, accuracy competition, which is basically the Formula One of watchmaking in the sense that it's not like Cosk where you submit hundreds of thousands of movements, but you submit one or two, and you very specially prepared that watch to perform as best as it possibly can. You, you have dedicated teams or watchmakers working on just that one movement, you know, to make sure that it scores as much of the available 1,000 points as you can, as it can. And uh, so basically they had to pull the plug on it because most of the brands who submitted uh, their watches said that they... I mean, the observatory can only say that they enter the competition if they win. <laughs> Imagine Formula One, if they could only tell who won. Like, you sit down, you watch the race, and then 90 minutes later, they say, oh, it's Ferrari. And then they don't tell you that there's, like, another, you know, nine teams in the race. Uh, and, and that's because that's how thin the skins, you know, uh, and how egotistical these brands have become at this point. Oh, if we don't win, then we have to save face. I, I'm not aware of any other competition in any other walk of life where they have to, like, stop doing it because brands just simply don't want to compete in the, you know, because they, they are worried about losing face, which is impossible. It's a competition. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. That's just how it works. And so that's where it ended. And um, the the premise of this article is actually not this, because this would have been a perfect grinding gears that I just, uh, <laughs> I just gave you guys for free. <laughs> part two. <laughs> yeah, part two. Uh, but basically, it's more about uh, cost, uh, chronometer certifications, other third-party or even uh, brand-performed uh, certifications or tests of quality of, uh, of finishing and or a movement accuracy. And all of that is going down the drain as we speak. Yes, I mean, I, I kind of understood Cosk. I've got a couple of Cosk regulated watches, and I kind of understood the problems with Cosk in that it was the movement rather than the whole watch. It was as many positions. It just wasn't quite as you know sturdy as perhaps they gave the impression of. And then everybody started coming up with their own in-house, a bit like somebody people's in-house movements. They had their in-house certification. And then some of the in-house certification then became, again, exclamation marks, independent. And so it just appears to be a complete mishmash. So we had a new one recently from Omega. They, they produced another certification process for their movements. So in your analysis of them all, is there one that actually is like, yeah, that makes sense. If, if you have a watch that's like that, you know it's a good watch because it's been certified by X, Y, and Z? Or, as you say, is it just a case, yeah, if you buy a Group 4, so you know it's going to keep good time? You have to spend half a million quid, but it'll keep good time. Well, I think an important distinction here is that COSC only tests the movements, like tree, cased, and everything, independent of the watch. The movement might be great, the watch might be absolute garbage, but COSC certified movement... Metis, it's the watch after casing, and there's also more stringent parameters involving anti-magnetism and whatnot. So at least at that point, just like Rolex's superlative chronometer standards, it's the watch after its case. Could you imagine if like the performance of a car was based on the engine block, but not anything to do with the car? It's like it's a really, really great engine. Um maybe we did a good job with the rest of it, like. But, maybe not <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. there's no standard for the rest of it but like the engine that we didn't do is top notch you know like <laughs> that is just the That's Italian principle analogy. of making cars is it not Alfa Romeo great engine nah, rest of it's maybe a bit shonky dodgy or the British car industry great engines the electronics are a bit shonky <laughs> like yes. any, any modern Land Rover you buy good engines the rest of it was probably built on a Friday afternoon that was one of my favorite Christopher Ward slogans they used to have in their like uh, magazines. It was uh, British design, Swiss engineering, and thank God it's not the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, not not too shabby. So, David, what is the best uh, system now? Who's who's doing it right? 
what watches, independent systems, it be Metas or Cosk or any of these other ones, which one actually says something proper about the quality of a watch? Yeah, I, I think uh, I would have to give this one to uh, to Omega for, for the Metas certified uh, master chronometer tests because it, it includes magnetism, which is um, a very common thing and an issue and something that affects all mechanical watches in the world that you can think of. Unless they are meta certified, because fifteen thousand Gauss is a whole lot of Gauss, so <laughs> that means your watch is, is pretty well prepared. The accuracy rating between zero and plus five, I think, is, is pretty solid, um, and it's just a, it's it's just a good overall test that also includes, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, power reserve, self winding efficiency, uh, of course, accuracy before and after being magnetized and demagnetized, and all those kinds of things. And and for that reason, and I believe that you can look at the the performance report of the watch from those tests based on the little card or whatever that that is uh, given to you you know with the with the purchase so so it's even traceable it's not like oh we 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 did spend a thousand hours testing this one but we will never tell you you know how or where or you know with what results so that for that reason it's really good rolex i think uh, with Rolex, the quality um, speaks for itself. I mean, you cannot, you know, it's it's incredible that you can produce over a million watches and test them to and and hold them to a such high standards. So that's that's amazing. And then, you know, if we if we're looking for the niche of the niche of certifications, you have Qualité Fleurier, uh, which is also basically a defunct <laughs> certification as all the brands have backed out, and it's only Chopard now who have actually taken over the whole certification thing. And Carl Friedrich Schreifler said, look, this is so great. Uh, we should not let this go. Let's keep it um, alive. And uh, they still produce a handful of quality Fleury watches every year. So, And that is also a very fine certification as well. Mm. So if we were to you know, recreate the competitions, not allowing watchmakers to fiddle with the movements beforehand, if, if we just had unlimited resources to go into watch stores and buy watches, Grand Seiko spring drive aside, so pure mechanical watches, who do you think would produce the most accurate watch straight off the bat reliably? So, yes, the marketing material says it's X, Y, and Z, but there's maybe some variety in what actually comes out of the factory. Who do you think would actually just buying the watch have the most accurate? Would it still be the group of forces of this world? Who would be reliable? Ripley, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm happy to go, but I just, I've yeah, spoken already I, so no, much. <laughs> I, I, I'm thinking about it. Honestly, I, I think, um, I mean, Rolex is always going to be a pretty strong standard in that, um, although they're not nearly as transparent with their, you know, what a superlative chronometer actually means as far as the nature of the exact tests in the same way that Metis is. And then also, you know, Omega with Metis opens it up to other brands. So, you know, Tudor produces a watch that's Metis certified because Metis isn't Omega, you know, it's an independent uh, certification. So in my opinion, I do kind of put a little bit more weight on that just because it might not, you know, minus two plus two is a more stringent than zero to plus five. Uh, but at least you have a pretty good sense of what Metis certification constitutes, whereas superlative chronometer standards, we have certain parameters but a lot of it is kind of murky and it's you know in the guise of the rolex way um that said i still think rolex just sight unseen is going to be producing a really really solid watch for the money omega as well for the mass produced ones and then uh yeah i'm sure Google force he could would still be putting something for really 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 good at half a million dollars <laughs> <laughs> david yeah i agree i think it's it's rolex and omega probably um, when, when we're talking about like you know um, qu manufactured quantities, and once you go super niche, of course, then you, then you can find other ones as well. Right, Roger Smith can spend all day long regulating that one watch. That's like their output for the whole month, you know. So that that's a, kind of a different thing than Rolex. Yes, and you can tell him that you're working at a desk, and him, he will set it up for a forty-five degree angle. <laughs> so when you're doing this, it's just perfect. <laughs> I, I don't know uh, if you are noticing, but I'm just seeing the image on YouTube. Uh, do tune into the show, a blog to watch weekly live, and the the position. Yeah, David has just altered it. <laughs> the, I don't know if you're familiar with the sketch. The uh, I think it's the middle class, upper class, lower class John Cleese sketch where they're all in a line, 
Uh, but that's what it looked like briefly there, because David was slowly sinking under the table. Uh, yeah, in it the wasn't me. It was, it, it, it was this <laughs> it's, thing it's, rotating. So yeah. I'm sitting in the same way, but it's just the, the freaking laptop. David is just badly regulated. That's what the problem is. He's, yes. he's unwinding <laughs> slowly. <laughs> More power reserve is required. <laughs> Right, yes. let's talk about a particular watch and a particular type of watch. We we seem to have become the Bugatti Jacob & Co. Uh, mm. website this week for, yes. for reasons that I don't fully understand, but David, you're going to explain it to us. So let's start with the, I think was the first pass at this, which is uh, actually what is a tourbillon and why is there a car named after it? So do do explain for the uninitiated what's going on. Yeah, I was surprised to see that Bugatti has named its its new car the Tourbillon. And uh, I was like, wow, I mean, that can only come from watches and watchmaking. So that's pretty cool. And I immediately jumped in on all the videos, um, of course, and an embargo was lifted. So you could find many videos all at the same time um, debuting this uh, this new car. And I, I heard, basically, I found all the uh, car journalists butcher the description and the explanation of what a Tourbillon is. <laughs> and then Mate Rimac, or actually Rimac, Mate Rimac, the CEO of the brand, uh, has also just has provided a more or less okay um, explanation. And I say more or less because... Sometimes even watch brands get it get it wrong. You know, it's very difficult. Sometimes the description gives you the impression that the Tourbillon is, a, is an anti-gravity machine that can negate the effects of gravity and stuff like that. And it's just a whole bunch of nonsense. And I thought that, you know, it could be cool uh, as car guys are doing their research um, to find, you know, something like this and uh, find an article that explains to them what a Tourbillon is and how backwards it is in the world of watchmaking where a lot of the Tourbillon equipped watches are less accurate than their non-Tourbillon counterparts. Mm. Mm. And so does the Tourbillon within the context of the car, is is there more significance than just it's called? Like, is there is there a Tourbillon in the car for some reason? I don't understand. Uh, have, have another go at explaining this, this link between Bugatti and Tourbillons, as opposed to calling it the Jacob & Co car. There is a tourbillon in the car if you wear your Jacob & Co when you get in, or another ah, tourbillon, right, okay. that's fine. But, <laughs> not, but not, not, not a tourbillon per se fitted to the car, which is ironic because in the past there was a Bugatti concept car that had a tourbillon in it, but was not called a tourbillon. But there is now a Bugatti tourbillon car that does not have a tourbillon in it. <laughs> Uh, but dear. that was back when with, uh, with, with Parmigiani and Fleurier, and it was, a, it was a really cool concept, and it was a little bit like a, a, a Beauvais-like transforming watch where you could take it out uh, of its case and you could put it on the dashboard, and it did have a tourbillon in it. David, how much is the car? Uh, $4.3 million. And it doesn't include a tourbillon? What are we even doing with ourselves right now? It's <laughs> an other $340,000 for you, sir, if you want the watch. Do, do you think if you bought a Bugatti for 4.3, you would be able to get a discount in the Jacob & Co? Or do you think they they're going like, to What are you poor? No, <laughs> we charge you half a million now that you ask. <laughs> no, no discount for you. I, no. I, I, explain to me the car, David. Is the car any good before we deal with the watch? Well, I, I did have the the privilege of, of visiting the the Bugatti um, factory with back with with Parmigiani just shortly before the uh, the, the collaboration ended actually, and um, mm -hmm. it's incredible. I, I they took me out in, in the in the Chiron, and it's just this this infinite amount of power. So if you feel like if you just keep on accelerating, you will go you know with eight hundred miles an hour eventually. <laughs> it's impossible to imagine the car ever uh, slowing down. It's just you feel the same sort of of, of push all the way through and then the brakes are absolutely incredible as well it was a really really fantastic experience it's uh, i think it's a tremendous privilege to even sit in one or be taken out and then to have something like this to drive um whenever whenever you um you know uh, you fancy it just must be an, an incredible experience now we'll have a we'll have a quick look at the watch for those of you on the video you'll get to see from the website. This is Jacob & Co Bugatti Tourbillon watch has a working V16 engine. I, I, I need to push into the idea that it's a working V16 engine. Uh, so like, the watch actually... has an engine, but the car doesn't have a tourbillon. I just want to make sure we're clear <laughs> on this. 
<laughs> yes, oh, that's, yes. A, that's, that's, that's hilarious. <laughs> that is correct. My, my que- but my question is, if you were to put the watch in the car, bear in mind we've been talking about watch regulation and accuracy. Is the turbine on the watch good enough to withstand the G-forces that you can create in the car? Or does the combination of the car and the watch actually make this watch almost pointless? Because actually driving this car the way it's meant to be driven while wearing the watch the way it's meant to be worn actually makes the watch inaccurate because the tourbillon can't cope with the real G-forces that happen as you corner at 220 miles an hour. If you flip the car, it becomes a multi-axis tourbillon, right? So... <laughs> you're just, you're just flying the through the air. And, and you're yeah, imagine flying through the air in your tourbillon, like somersaulting, and you're just like, oh, this is fine. Now, now my watch is even more accurate <laughs> before That's you right. land in a forest somewhere. That's great. <laughs> it's like that plane, like the Vomit Comet, whereby just as you reach the top of the, the, the flying jump, all forces of gravity disappear Mm -hmm. and your watch becomes super accurate just before the engine block makes its way through your body into a gazillion pieces. They will know precisely when you died. That's that's the point. (laughs) It'll be down to the exact second. That's right. Do do death certificates record time to two decimal places? I don't know. Just to the nearest minute. They do when your engine has a V16, V12. What is this, David? (laughs) <laughs> it's a V16, but you, you, it will have the uh, the fine print on your report saying, like, but it was not a chronometer certified tourbillon, so we can't be absolutely sure. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob not to mention the fact that, up to Metas. Yeah, not to mention the fact that most billion, gazillionaires don't set their watches probably for the accurate time, so it's like it would just show whatever. <laughs> At least, yeah, you know, I, I think there's a high probability for that. <laughs> Is there like an inverse proportion rule that the richer you are, the less like you are to actually set your watch to the accurate time? <laughs> I think we can hazard that guess, yes. <laughs> you think you think there's a you know, as a watch becomes technically more accurate, it's actually less often set accurately. I think that would be an interesting survey. We should go around watches and wonders next year with like a digital clock with the actual atomic time. And as we go around the booths, check with the, well, actually the brand owners, if we can find them, as to what time it says on their watch and compare it and see if the success of the brand directly correlates to the accuracy of the watch to the atomic clock. Well, it's a good one. I, I, I think it's fair enough to say that the car is better looking than the watch. Yeah, I think so too. you broadly agree? Yeah. Yeah, the watch is, a, is an odd-looking thing a little bit, really. Um, it, it's going to be spectacular to use, probably very nicely made. Um, you know, it's you know the whole thing, the engine block, everything is, is incredible. But the whole blackness with the, with the you know the black case and the black bezel and the black strap and the black crown and all the rest of it is just a bit too you know a bit too much. So, in what way does the engine work? Like it it produces its dynamism by what you winding the watch or the watch running. No, you have to wind it separately, and it has its own power reserve indicator. So um, it is, you have to wind it through the crown in one mm-hmm. direction. You, you wind, wind that mechanism, and in the other, you wind the movement, as far as I understand it. And you have 20 oh. um, uh, launches or 20 uses of this, of this automaton before you have to wind it again. So it has its own uh-huh. uh, power source. It has its own crankshaft. The crankshaft is turning, and as it is turning, of course, it is moving the titanium pistons up and down in, uh, in their respective cylinders so you and even the firing order of course there's no fire no explosion but the firing order or the sequence in which they they traverse mm-hmm. is, is also correct to the engine right so the engine aspect of it as you say is an automaton rather than linked in any way to the time telling is that correct yes it's completely independent yes right so it's just a fidget spinner is what we're saying Yes, it, yeah, a fantastic fidget it, spinner. It's yes, the <laughs> car equivalent of like the Jacques Adro stuff. It's nothing to do yes. with the timekeeping. It's just there to look cool, and and which it does quite a bit. But yeah, it's the automotive enthusiast instead of the bird, charming bird enthusiast or hmm. something like that. Yes, yes. So, would you even vaguely come close to spending three hundred forty thousand dollars? 
And how cheesy would it be to own both the car and the watch? You need to. That's the thing. It doesn't cost yes. $340,000. What are you going to do? Just own the Bugatti Jacob & Co. and not own a Bugatti? That's the most ridiculous posturing I can think of. If You if you have to get the car if you own the watch. And so then it becomes a $4 million at point three three, you know, we're, we're called call four and a half million once you're all said and done. Yeah, but I do notice that there's 250 cars, but 150 watches. Is that right? So they're expecting some people to drop the ball and nope. not invest in what? the full thing. Or is it the other way around? No. There, there will be other ones, so other other variations, other case styles, gem set ones, whatever. So they, they will produce a full 250, but you know mm-hmm. it's just the first 150 for those who have who don't have a personality yet. <laughs> they just want to like watch for $340,000. But if you are like you know like your game, then you can get one of those green sapphire ones for 1.5 million. Ariel did a hands on with one of those huh. like two years ago. You can find that. <laughs> On a block to watch, green sapphire case, Bugatti engine, fitted, freaking Jacob & Co. Or you can have gem set ones, they're spectacular gem set ones as well. So I'm sure there will be a lot more, you know, like some very exciting ones. And of course, you can, I'm pretty sure, you can always tell Jacob & Co. to make uh, a, mm. a unique one just for you. It does strike me as a bit odd, the idea that you buy your car and you'll get to personalize it, uh, unless they're all be made the same color and the same spec, I assume if you want different leather seats or a different color, but they want to sell exactly the same watch to 150 people. And they don't yeah, think, that's as you say, strange. these people are going to go, no, I don't want the one that everybody else has got. I'm buying a Bugatti that's completely unique. But yeah, of course I want the same watch as 150 other Bugatti owners. Just put a different strap on it. <laughs> <laughs> Orange NATO. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does does this have uh, no no? It's it's integ- it's an integrated bracelet. So yeah, I you know own, that it, it's, it's, it's hilarious more. for all kinds of wrong reasons. <laughs> you three hundred forty thousand dollars to stand now. I mean, it's hilarious. <laughs> you gotta buy exactly the same watch. I, yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not convinced. So if you weren't gonna wear this Jacob and Cool watch for your Brigatti, what would be the alternative? You've got three hundred forty thousand dollars to spend. You can spend it on something else as a watch. What are you buying instead of this to go with your Bugatti? I mean, bring me some more personality. And to anything from watches and wonders, I feel like everything we saw was six figures. Uh, I'll get the Art Time. <laughs> I'll get the Art Time ART uh, 01 in rose gold and the IWC Platinum Eternity Calendar. And I think that's maybe roughly around the same price. One's about 150, one's about 200. Uh-huh. So, you know. Um, that, seems, that seems reasonable. David? Oh, I would just get something with gems on it. That, that's where I would start. The more gems, Rainbow the better. Detona. Rainbow yes. Detona. Rainbow yeah. Detona. Just go. David, but, but, yeah, going but to take just... 50,000 of that and go off to the Hong Kong Watch and Clock Show and just get a ju- crazy custom case. Absolutely paper baguettes. I, I would just get a Ziploc full of colorful stones and I would just bring it to Switzerland and say, like, can you make something out of this? <laughs> you just get a, some crit stick, crazy glue, dashboard of Bugatti and just like sprinkle... The colorful Perfect. gems across the dashboard. That'd be fine. Just like like people who stick gems to their face or whatever. What is it called? I Bedazzled, mean, bejazzled or whatever it's called. <laughs> He's just going to bejazzle his Daytona. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, right. Uh, well, perhaps you might consider getting one of these. Uh, Ripley, you referred the Sphistos. It's Sphistos, is that how you pronounce it? Kushos? Metropolitan chrono skeleton sapphire watch i do feel like a sapphire watch might go quite well with the bugatti uh tell us why we should consider these as an alternative to frankly anything um (laughs) so if you want a sapphire watch but you don't necessarily want a sapphire engine in your in your watch uh this is a fantastic alternative uh kustos is the like sibling company of frank Mueller. Even though they're entirely independent, uh, they it's kind of like more of a Rolex Tudor thing. So there's obviously some design language shared between them. Uh, this watch here is a heavily reworked version of like a you know seven seven five zero base, but as you can see, they've done the bridges themselves, which is why it looks this way. Um, sapphire case, full sapphire exterior, rose gold components on that one. You can scan the QR code um, on the rotor, and it pulls up the authenticity ownership. And I highly suggest you just scan the screen if you have in it. There's a little Easter egg for you that the brand left is on the review sample. But um, it's shockingly affordable for a full Sapphire watch. 
I remember being in college when the uh, RM whatever came out with its full sapphire case at like one point something million dollars. Um, I think this is around like 50K. Um, and it, it, yeah, it's just a ton of fun. Um, and, you know, obviously, should you need a mainspring or something, this isn't going to be a five figure service to just get it running again. It's going to be a four figure service. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned about the QR code. Did somebody not scan this QR code and realize it was a real watch and so registered it? Well, is it a real watch, Rick? Do you know this, uh, the, the the honorable reverend that is stated to be the owner of this piece? <laughs> no, I have, I, have not, I have not scanned the QR code, but I have read the chat on the a Blog to Watch article and there, there does appear to, to be some uh, shenanigans going on with this QR code. I'm, I'm not sure I'm not sure the entire truth of, of, of the report. It's, uh, um, it's one of their display samples that I photographed at their HQ in Switzerland. So this is one of their own watches. It's a display model, but uh, they found a very creative way of absolutely voiding its digital record should... Um, should anyone ever try to nick it and uh, pass it off as their own piece. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, you can go and have a look at that. I This is a brand, Ripley, you've reviewed this watch. That I, it came on my radar a couple of years ago, but I've only heard good things about it. I've, every time somebody sees it, they go, oh, that's uh, really quite interesting. And this is the RZE. And this one is the Urbanist Solar Field Watch. Uh, and because this is currently being broadcast live, my phone is ringing. Uh, so I'll be answering that shortly. While Ripley, you give us the SP on this from RZE. So this is their uh, it's their court, solar quartz model, first sol solar model from them, uh, their least expensive model. So you get a hardened titanium case, just like the rest of their lineup. Um, it's their like ultra hex surface coating, brings the hardness up to like 1200 bickers. Um, solar movement from Miota. Interesting thing about this one is the solar panel, instead of being through like a transparent dial, like how most brands do it, it's actually hidden around like in the rehot. So if you look kind of diagonal through the crystal, you sort of see a clear plastic rehot. And what that basically is, is the outer cover for the solar panels that sit around it. Um, it, it's about as idiot proof as a watch gets screw down crown, all hardened titanium. Uh, this is the medallion yellow. They're kind of signature colorway. They also make a black dial one, a blue one. I believe they got two, uh, special editions that have Cerakote coatings. One's tan, one's olive green that, uh, benefit like helicopter rescue and wildlife services in Canada. Um, but it's their least expensive piece for like a grab and go field watch. It's 36 mil, super lightweight. Um, what's not to like, it's, you know, it's a really cool piece. There's, um, if you like the aesthetic and like the size format and like the concept of a solar watch, uh, the only thing I'd change about it would be to like, give it fixed lugs or something like that. Cool. Well, I, I actually heard none of that cause I was on the phone, but I'm sure it was a great review of, of the RZ. <laughs> I can chime in. I mean, it's, it's Go a fantastic it. looking watch. I, I really like this one actually. Uh, it's not too expensive. What it's like two fifty nine, two hundred fifty nine dollars. You get a tight. I wish there were there were like some other strap options. How comfortable is the strap? I mean, the strap is fine. It's like a it's a nicely made NATO. It's got a uh, pretty chunky black DLC coated titanium hardware, uh, which is all very nice. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a fine strap. It's a NATO strap. I think I, uh, the, the cool part about this is I think a lot of people are going to get one. And then have a ton of fun switching it up. It's standard 18 mil lux, and the spring bars are removable. So I'm sure people are going to put all sorts of different funky things on it that kind of lean into the different dial colors. Because um, some of the other variants where it's like a tan Cerakote case, I'm sure that might look really cool on certain like leather or sailcloth straps. Um, so yeah, you, you get a black NATO. It's a nice NATO, but um, the, the example I have right here, I put like a dark green fur lawn on it, and that, you know, because it's sweltering in los angeles right now i mean it's like th there's five different versions there's a black dial blue dial yellow dial and then as you say you have 
this bronze-ish or tank colored um, case with a brown dial and you have a green colored case with a black dial and the last three so it's the yellow the brown and the and the and the, and the green case black dial fantastic looking watches very cool and I, and I like the idea of, of these just you know leaving you know just you put it on and you forget about it you know it's solar it's cheap you can beat it up uh, and it looks great loom looks decent as well I didn't know, I, you know, just before we started, I, I had no idea these even existed, but I quite like this. <laughs> yeah, I've always been impressed with their stuff. Like, I've seen a number of the watches in the metal. Uh, their whole thing is, like, hardened titanium stuff. But, like, for the price point, I think they, they're kind of fantastic quality watches. And it's a fun brand, too. They kind they make other strange things, like some EDC items. But, um, you know, it's... There's no moving parts on the exterior, so if you get it really dirty, lurk working on a farm like you tend to, Rick, you can just kind of hold it under a sink and wipe it down. There's no bezel to get jammed up or anything like that. What, what are you saying? Like, are you saying I'm a bit messy? I mean, I recently heard about an air king that was lost in a field that after being eaten by a cow for 50 years or something like that. So I, the first thing I think is, oh, Rick, you got your air king back. But I got my air king back. Yeah, then I realized, oh, it's 34 mil. That's the size I wear. That, That's not yours. Exactly. Whatsoever. Was not my, was not, not my Air King. I, I do think, see this one video, we should appreciate, because I've not actually seen what the hat is today, but the Grand Seiko t-shirt's looking good. But what's the cap? What's today's cap? Brooklyn? So we've got Grand Seiko on the shirt, GS9 Club mm -hmm. on the hat, GS9 Club oh. on the pin. And to celebrate the illustrious manufacturing of the Greater Seiko Corp, we got <laughs> Philip Lane on the wrist because it uses the Seiko <laughs> MH70 skeletonized movement. So we are celebrating every aspect of the great house. Oh, I, got, I, I got an Epson printer over there too. Yeah, yeah. I got an Epson, Epson printer, printer. Epson, <laughs> Epson on the printer. We're celebrating the whole Seiko family over here today. And the problem with that story is the most expensive thing in the room is the ink. Oh, I'm actually due for in the cartridges. Cart I'm, I'm actually due for new ink cartridges, so that's um, <laughs> yeah, that's the reason I won't be buying a Drupal 4C next week, boys. <laughs> go, on, go on, get some more ink. Hi, I'm Ariel Adams from a blog to watch. I'd like to tell you about Bezel, the modern app for buying and selling authenticated high-end watches. Bezel isn't like other platforms. Bezel was designed exclusively for today's timepiece collectors and enthusiasts, offering choice, convenience, safety, and service. In addition to personally authenticating each timepiece sold on the marketplace, Bezel also offers a personal concierge service to walk you through any part of the watch buying or selecting process. Want something not currently listed on Bezel? Their concierge service is happy to seek one out for you. Buying and selling a watch can be scary as well as challenging, especially with all the options out there today. Bezel uses a modern, intuitive interface to deliver a class-leading technology experience that makes it simple and fun to search through available watches or list one you currently want to sell. Try Bezel today and discover what others like you are already excited about. Get the Bezel app or use the getbezel.com website. That's G-E-T-B-E-Z-E-L.com. Thanks. Right. Well, before we play Hit Miss, maybe we will go for this. Some new releases. Let's see if anybody really cares from Omega, Omega Seamaster, Aquaterra, Black Dial watches. I, I really rather quite like these, but quite liking them and caring about it is a different matter. Ripley, is there any reason why I should care about another range extension from Omega and the Aquaterra? Um, I, I care that they didn't already make this before. Like, if you think about like the Aquaterra, there's like well over a hundred SKUs in the current collection. And then you think about like, what would be probably something that would exist in the Aquaterra, like a uh, black, like plain black, gloss black. That's like the, it's like white or black quintessential dials. And it didn't actually exist. They had a black dial with the horizontal teak lines in it. Um, but they didn't have like a gloss black dial. Now you get it in the three. Uh, core sizes obviously there's others so you get 34 38 41 um you know all master chronometer movements Th fantastic watches honestly this is the type of watch that like kind of the non-watch person could easily buy wear every single day for the rest of their life give it to their kid and just never think about nice watches ever again um but it's absolutely flooring that with a hundred and something skews in the current lineup these three watches didn't already exist uh, I, you also get like a more refined break slitting class, but yeah, you know, the real story here is the black lacquer dials. 
Mm. Uh, my question is, uh, they have got the date window, and it's a square window, so to speak, in the round larger up, versions. Round and on they've the gone 34. A round window on the 34. Should we feel patronised uh, that what they are clearly pitching as the smaller, more petite, more ladies' watch, perhaps, gets a round window? I, I don't understand the I don't understand the logic that says let's make the smaller one more curvy, like the the numeral indicators are curved rather than angular. It's the shape of the hour marker. So the so the date window usually has to go with the with the design of the of the of the hour markers. And the smaller ones that is probably intended for you know for more feminine proportions and whatever else, it's, it's you know it, it it works much better. And on the larger ones, you have not really square. It's more like a trapezoid shape um, that that is complementary to the to the design of the hour markers. It's designed to blend in a little bit, and I think it does. Uh, but you know, if it were round on the larger ones, it would go with the Omega logo up at twelve o'clock. So maybe you know below twelve o'clock. So maybe that could work as well. Um, I ju I just wish you know it's just like just stop stop putting the freaking date on things. <laughs> we don't need to know the date. We've got yes. calendars for that. I just think that it, it ruins the smaller watch by making it less... The Aquatel is actually quite a rugged-looking watch, quite angular in its face. It's quite a... Dare I say, is butch the right word? I don't know. But it, it's it's a chunky watch. It feels chunky. And I just think they've ruined it on the small one. I think the small one with the same design cues would actually have looked really nice. And I think That's they've a good just point. ruined it by, by making it... Fem, you know, by making it what they determined to be feminine, uh, it's 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 a weird one. I'll be interested to know. I'll be interested to see what sells the best out of this particular range. Rip, play give final the, thoughts on this. Or give it the it. number of SKUs you can bet at events. It's only a matter of time before that becomes a thing. You know, it's just like they just, they just keep throwing things at the wall, and then sooner or later <laughs> you will have the small one with the large ones things, and then the, the large one with the small ones design, and uh, it all comes together eventually. You just have to I mean, wait suppose, another couple of years. I suppose you know Omega are privy to Swatch's now broken AI generator, mm -hmm. so I suppose as you say they'll get there eventually. I, I final thoughts. I almost want to like play mash up with the different things the 34 is a little bit I, I've, I've seen the 34 aqua terrors the current gen and the metal and i'm not big on the shape of the hour markers or the date window either uh and even the format i like a small watch but it wears pretty small for a 34 in the same way the Speedmaster wears pretty small for a 42 uh those twisted lugs do kind of truncate the wearing experience a bit um 38 is probably the sweet spot i'd love maybe millimeter small or whatever but it doesn't uh the 34 and the 38 are both powered by the 8800 series movement the 8900 series is what's in the 41 and that's where you get the independently adjustable hour hand which is cool so i kind of wish it had that feature on the smaller format they all cost the same uh which is nice i guess um so i guess there's no real reason to choose one over the other you just choose the one you like the best but um you know i I think it's such a smart move for Omega to make these watches. The, the Aqua Terra is objectively a great piece, but it's not like the enthusiast choice. It's not like the Ultraman Speedmaster or something like that. So to have this like really, really kind of classic timeless option in the lineup for probably one of their most mainstream watches is a logical decision. Even if it's something that we're looking at it going like, wait, it's a stainless steel time and date watch with the black dial. It's like, yeah, and they're probably going to move thousands and thousands and thousands of units of it. Mm -hmm. Right, well, go and check that out at ablogtowatch.com. We're now going to let a couple of people into the room to play Hit Miss Maybe, and hopefully they got the message that this show is being live broadcast and don't come in all unprepared. But let's let Kevin and Alon in and quickly remind them that they are live on a Blog to Watch Weekly Live. Uh, good morning, Alon. How are you? Good morning, good morning. I'm doing very well. I'm actually excited. This is a live recording because it's going to be my second one. Well, I'm going to second do two, so this is my first one. Excellent. And Kevin is joining us, but already we have a Kevin is experiencing connectivity issues. Kevin, Earth to Kevin. Come in, Kevin. Are you there? Nope. Kevin, Kevin is 
delayed for some reason. Internet speed has not quite reached central London uh, at this stage or wherever he is living today. So we will assume that Kevin may appear. At the moment, you're just going to get to watch a little black uh, dot screen while he sorts himself out. But we will get started. So let's do what we'd normally do and see who everybody is and where they are. David, where are you and what are you wearing? I'm in Budapest and uh, I'm wearing an IWC pilot watch that I have written the review on and it's just uh, waiting to be published. Oh, very good, very good. And, and uh, gets a thumbs up in general, the pilot's watch? Uh, I had to like do some mental exercises and picture who this is for. And if I pictured that, then yes. But if it's not for you, which is, I think, a much broader spectrum, then no. Right. Okie dokie. Ripley, Great Wall of Ripley, repping everything Seiko this morning. Uh, and you've already revealed so far you're wearing a Seiko derivative of some kind. No, it's a Seiko yes. movement, but it is in the Philip Klein. I don't even know the name of this one. It's the green. <laughs> green. It's just green. <laughs> it's very green, and the whole thing fluoresces under a black light. Um, oh, right. Okay. Oh, that's cool. It uses the Se Seiko NH70 movement, so we are still in theme. We're celebrating mm. their distributor status to as, you know, probably one of the largest third-party makers. Very good, very good. I, Alon, where are you and what are you wearing? I am in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. I felt lucky. I felt green. So I went with the Elka... A Skola Diversity Series. So it's the second dial of the Hebrew version, which we have in four versions. Very nice. Very nice indeed. I am in Scotland. I am wearing a Panerai. Nothing new there then. Okay, let's make a start. Kevin, I've kicked Kevin out of the room. We'll see if he reappears with his internet all connected. Uh, first up is going to be this. And we're going to do a bit of colour today. So, a bit of variegation. So, Ripley, you reviewed the Bell & Ross BR05 Artline Steel & Gold Watch. We on this show have always been fans of Bell & Ross. Always unusually drawn to them, but never owned one. Should this be one I should consider owning after having looked at it? Well, um, that'll give away my choice here, but let, let, let's go. I'll get into <laughs> what it is. It's the Artline series. This name gets described for their artistically uh, oriented versions of the BRO5 integrated bracelet watch. Um, came out in 2022 with a, like a silver version of this, so all stainless steel. The Artline name was also used to, the, to do the one with the, all the dragon engravings on it that was released earlier this year for the Chinese Zodiac. Now, this is the two-tone Artline, so you get some rose gold plates on the center links of the bracelet and the bezel. Um, it's important to note that uh, despite the fairly handsome price increase, the gold bits don't actually appear to be solid. So on the steel one, you'll notice uh, that the, the, the bezels basically just has grooves into it, as do the center links. On the this one, it's like gold plates attached to the components. But if you look at the backside of the bracelet, you just see uninterrupted steel surfaces. So it doesn't look to be that much gold, but it is one of the more ornate and unusual and striking Bell & Ross models uh, currently available. At twelve thousand eight hundred dollars, I believe. Yes, twelve thousand eight hundred dollars. I, I suspect that price tag might come up in a wee minute. But we have been joined by the elusive Kevin. Kevin, can you hear us? Earth to London, come in London. Yes, nope. I can Kevin's hear you, yeah. lips are moving, but I can hear nothing. <laughs> All right, okay, that was uh, very good, very clever. Oh, yes, there, yes, like there. that. You got me there. That was good. <laughs> that was good. What was the comedian that used to do that? <laughs> oh, I don't remember. A bit before my time, probably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, where are you, Kevin? What are you wearing? I am in uh, on the South Kent coast. I'm wearing a, a swatch. I don't know if you remember this. This was the Q watch from a Bond movie. Oh, very good. Back in the day. Yeah, a bit different. Yes. Yeah, I liked yes. it. The, his technology works somewhat better than yours this morning. 100%. 100%. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, we have quickly looked at the Bell and Ross. I, Kevin, completely blind. You're going to have to join in with the rest of us and go. Is it a hit, a miss, or a maybe? One, two, three, go. 
Miss, maybe, maybe. A couple of maybes and three misses. David, why is it a maybe? Oh, it's a very Marmite watch. I, I can't help but like it for some reason. I look at it and I'm like, I'm happy it exists. I'm happy it's like this. It's, it's an odd looking watch. I'm not a fan of the gold plates. I mean, it should be solid links all around, especially for almost $13,000. Um, well, your retention will probably be an issue, but overall, <laughs> I think it's just a great, it's, I just look at it. I mean, it, it has taken so many rounds and so many years of repetition and trying again, trying this, trying that to end up with this. It's, I think I really appreciate that effort that has gone into that and the progress that has gone into it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Alon, how did you vote? I voted maybe. And maybe because I do love Bella Ross. I love the BR05. It's a stunning watch. I don't like two-tone watches for me personally, but I have a gut feeling that my dear friend Cedric Bellon designed on this iteration as well. I love the stripes and it reminds me of my Uhrwerk at the 10309. So I, I call these the Dunhill stripes. And I, I think it's done actually very elegantly. It's actually very cool. I like the rotor. Um, Ripley, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it a, is it a Kinesi movement? No. So uh, if it was the BRX5, you'd be getting the Kinesi. Those start about like seven and a half thousand. This is the BR like 302. It's basically the new version of the, you know, the updated version with the Salita SW300, so you get the longer, like, 56-hour power reserve or whatever. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, it's a $12,800 Salita. We're, you know... And, and, and a question for you wow. Americans, or, or everybody who uses feet, uh, usually we translate the 100 meters to 330 feet. I believe it's 32809, but they wrote 325. Does that annoy you guys? <laughs> <laughs> no, the uh, the United States system of measurements is honestly just a it's just a collective of, of delusion over on our side. Like we we're just making stuff up. We're so bad at math, and yet you're making me deal with like all these random numbers, like twelves and stuff, and none of it. Thirty two. What even? Why? Why? Why is water freezing at thirty two? Why is it boiling at two twelve? None of this makes any sense whatsoever. <laughs> so yeah, 325, 328, 330, 400. Like, whatever. None of, none of it means anything <laughs> to me in America. <laughs> That's why I always I, put 100 meters. At least we all kind of can agree on that. Like, I, 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 you'll yeah. never see me put like the feet measurement for a depth rating. It, 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 and it's amazing the 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 number of deaths in America because of diving accidents because of feet and meter confusion is is enormous. Apparently, it's a it's a real problem. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Ripley, <laughs> how did you vote? I said it's a miss, and it's not because I don't like the aesthetics of it. I thought the original one was uh, like an all steel was a very interesting uh, watch. It almost reminded me of like corrugated metal that you'd see on like a home built tool shed type of thing, but in a, in a cool way. Um, they say it's sort of like Art Deco inspired lines. I don't, I that's neither here nor there. I kind of like the way it looks. As David mentioned, at nearly thirteen thousand dollars, it really should have just solid gold components. And and and, and put in, please put in the Kinesi movement because that's a very strong ask at that price point. Um, and, and it's really the price point that makes me give it the miss. The full steel version is less than half the price, so you're paying a you know what six grand, sixty two hundred dollars or something like that for effectively whatever the little gold veneers that you can see on it. Um, but that's kind of the main reason for me. If this watch was priced at a marginal increase compared to the steel model, I'd probably say it's a bit Marmite, but it's sort of a maybe. But 12.8, that we're like in Daytona money, and that's a lot for a three-handed. I mean, that'd be, you might as well just get the solid gold one. I think you can get the solid rose gold BR05 on a leather strap for like less than twice the price of this. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of where I just, I can't wrap mm. my head around the value proposition of this one. Yep, I agree. I give it a miss. It's a gorgeous looking watch, but the price is absolutely outrageous. <laughs> You've effectively got little gold plates. There's This must have the least content of gold of a two-tone watch 
any no, this, Omega, this must be the least Omega cool. mission to moonshine seconds hand to enter the chat <laughs> okay fair enough <laughs> fair enough <laughs> kevin what did you give it i gave it a miss um mainly because i mean i caught the back end of the your explanation when you first showed the watch all i heard was the price and i saw the picture <laughs> and i thought no definitely no. not how can they justify <laughs> that uh, with the movement, I mean, it's just basically a Salita, as you say, 300 in there. It's just outrageous. I mean, I do like Bella Ross. I did like their um, their release from last year, Watches of Wonders, the Loom watch that they did. That was quite different. I think they've gone a bit too far out. I think they're, they're trying to get to a market which I don't think they will ever get to, purely because of their price point that they've been in at the moment i mean anything up to eight thousand dollars or eight thousand pounds um it's highly competitive and i think they should just stick to that sort of price range anything out of that people will just turn their heads and think oh my god what are they trying to do so yeah it's definitely a miss uh, gentlemen uh ripley and david you might have more of a knowledge what is the most expensive price that a salita movement has ever been attempted to be sold at a hundred thousand at least um, right, okay. for the tag that we covered um, a couple of months ago. Uh, but it actually is a is a topic that I want to cover at some point. Like the top five most expensive Salita fitted watches, and yeah. and that that tag is right up there. I hope the hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> you hope and that's a couple top. of diamonds <laughs> and some diamonds. Well, yeah, the most expensive stainless steel Salita movement or ETA movement. So nothing, nothing, no gold, no diamonds to inexcusably get the price. So if if anybody listening would like to nominate some watches for that particular category, we'll we'll maybe have a look at them in the next couple of weeks. What do you mean, no gold and no diamonds? I mean th that's the whole point. If you're spending a hundred thousand dollars, you're you're pay paying for all the markup on the gold and the diamonds to so just throw a freaking other movement in there somehow. I mean, just make it work. That's I the just, whole point. I just want to know who has had the. The, the hoochpa to, if that's the appropriate word, uh, Alan, you can correct me, uh, to, to overprice a Salita the most while not adding anything of intrinsic value such as gold or diamonds. You know what comes to mind is uh, what I think was epic, the Valjus 7750, so the uh -huh. Ita 7750, what IWC would, did with the first, the Da Vinci Perpetual, Rattrapant, and then the Il Distrio. So I was a hundred back in the day already 125k watch based on a ETA. So by the Solita, I need to rack my brain. And That's I need another shape. coffee. So I'll, I'll get back to that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get the, that. yeah, the Jacob and Co. Epic or Epic X was like twenty something thousand. I see that now. And you could get it on the rubber strap with a well, it had a, it did have a modified movement, so they did put some effort into the movement, though. So I'm not I'm not sure if that's the, that's the right call. But once it's over a hundred thousand, that's that's when you you know you're getting taken for a ride big time. <laughs> but well, since we're live, Rick, uh -huh. I don't know if we if you see I, I the hate, comments on YouTube. I, I hate I hate those words, Alan. I hate those words. Since we're live, <laughs> dot dot dot. That normally leads to trouble and cancellation. But go ahead. <laughs> well, since we're live. Viewers can now do the homework Absolutely. and we can make a quiz out of it. Let's see what our viewers yep. think. I don't know if you, if if you're tracking the YouTube comments cuz I'm I'm in uh, I, I I am but uh, no very few people are listening live cuz we didn't warn anybody in advance no, we, we were doing have. this. <laughs> so if you happen to be there, uh, if you're out there somewhere then please do chip in and in future weeks uh, do tune in a blog yeah, or do it in the comments if channel. you see this when uh, yeah. when we're not live anymore. Absolutely, absolutely. So cool well, game. let's uh, talk about a watch for Hitmas maybe that's got yeah, it's got a few folk hot under the collar. I uh, Ari was not here to tell us what he thought about it, but this is the Norcane Freedom 60 Chrono 40mm watches with summer 2024 dial colours. Yeah, this has got a few folk in the annoyed bracket, most of them going, how can you justify this price on this watch? Uh, 40mm Chrono, uh, from the same stable, I don't know if this is... Uh, what movement is this? Is it going to be a Kinesi movement? I'm not actually sure. I've not checked. It'll be uh, ETA. Uh, it's Algier, presumably Salida an ETA thing. if it's a chronograph. Yeah, it's a 43mm 
4,600 USD. Uh, yeah, some nice cars. Yeah, yeah, some nice cars. Pistachio, uh, the wee Norcan uh, badge that's on the side. This does appear to say Norcan quite a lot on it, from what I can gather. It is, and it's, def- so it's definitely it's definitely winning the award for how often can you tell us uh, what brand uh, you are. There's a kind of, I'm not quite sure what they're calling it, salmon or gold. Uh, and there's a date window. And I think it's the date window that's got most folk riled up because it appears to be situated in a different postcode from the rest of the watch. Certainly a different altitude at any rate. But gentlemen, for your delectation, is this a hit, a miss, or a maybe? One, two, three, go. Miss, maybe, 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 Mrs. Well, we're all quite ne- all got our negative pants on this morning. This is a miss for me because I don't get Norcan anymore. I don't get it. I, I, I think they they were they'd found a, a a journey to go on. They'd found a groove that they were in. And I don't know whether it's Jean-Claude Biver's involvement or whatever, but they just appear to have lost some momentum, some traction, all the positivity that was being viewed of this business, this brand appears to be leeching out of it for whatever reason. Now, maybe that's just us as watch geeks. Maybe they're doing great, selling loads of them. I don't know, but I'm not sure that this release is helping that particular cause. David, a maybe from you? Yes. Uh, it's, it's maybe because I really like the dial colors. I, I, the dial seems to be very high quality. I like the syringe hands. I like the way that they have color coordinated the date disc, which is a rarely seen thing. I was just shaking my head when people were mocking the date. That It's, it's very similar to what you see on most of the other 7750 or you know, 510 or 500 um, based watches but the the coordination is there the cutout is nicely done uh, i think it's it's over it's it's great i'm just really bored of this uh, of these 7750 architecture um uh, proportions it's such a chonker it's very very thick uh it's not going to be very comfortable to wear probably because it's because it's so thick and it's like 50 years down the road from when the the 7750 was developed i think it's high time that Celito or somebody whoever came up with a new movement that, that would result in, in slimmer and more quietly operating chronographs for the masses. Mm. Chronographs for the masses. Alon, how did you vote? I voted maybe. Maybe because it appeals to me. It reminds me of the old Breitling top times. And that maybe answers your question. So who's Norcane for? If the old, half of it is the old Breitling crew. And they are going into their old Brightling mates that our Brightling retailers are used to be, because Brightling is slashing all dealers worldwide to open mono brands. So they're filling that gap literally in stores and maybe on wrists. Your comment about Bivera, I think he only helped on the free one. Or was it called the free one? Or, you know, the wild the, one? Wild one. Wild one, yeah. Wild and free. So. He only helped on that and a bit of consultancy. Um, is this a lot of money? All of us think it is. But as we discussed earlier on this show, the old 1,000 is 2,000. The old 3,000 is 5,000. So today, this is not a lot of money. Although you can consider in Hamilton with an Valjou version, styled caliber, like David said, which you're fed up of. Or think of micro brands with using these cars. I'm thinking of a Aaron with Lebwanko, Le, Le right? And these a rock two and a half, three k. So those are contemplation, and that's why I'm in the in the maybe bracket. But it does look good. Yeah, I'll grant you, it's nice looking, and the the date window matching uh, color scheme uh, is is good to see. Ripley. Um, I like the dial colors. I said it was a miss. I like the dial colors. Uh, I don't like the date window, but that's a 430 date window is never the reason I'm going to give something a miss. 
as David mentioned, 40 mil wide with that chonker of uh, automatic movement, it's going to wear very thick, um, especially on a smaller wrist like mine. I don't really love how they printed on the underside of the crystal on the case back. I feel like that's riding on your windows. Um, and it's not like there's not enough text around the perimeter of it. They just, just incorporated into their... With, Put that instead of one of the other Norcane brandings on the case back. You know, do something <laughs> like that. Um, but really, again, it's the price point of this. Like at this price point, it's less than a thousand dollars to get your hands on a Tudor Black Bay Chrono on a bracelet, which gets you the Breitling B01 movement. Now, Breitling has obviously moved up market, leaving this void for, I guess, Norcane. But if you're looking to spend four or five thousand dollars on a chronograph, go over to Tudor and come up a little bit, several hundred dollars. And you get what's objectively a better spec movement um, from a brand with arguably more history. And that's clearly not going to be going anywhere anytime soon and has a very robust service network and all of that. So again, it's the price point of this. And if you wanted to spend this amount of money to get something a bit more off the beaten path, you could get a watch with the same type of movement at maybe about half the price or less. Um, and then if you wanted something a bit esoteric, like Drellum, so, a lot of their watches are like, 23 30 piece limited editions you're not going to run into another person like that and again 7750 movement without the 430 date um arguably better spec watch for you know a four figure price difference so again it's the price point not the watch where i just have a hard time wrapping mm. my head around it uh, for mike who does the show notes do you think we can agree on a spelling of the word chonker before we go any further, because I feel that needs to be in the title. O N K E R, Chonker. 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 Yeah, that, that'll do for our spelling bee. So, Mike, uh, your challenge is to fit the word Chonker into the show note title. Kevin, how did you vote? I voted uh, maybe. Um, I have an issue with the price, like Ripley and Alan has, has mentioned before. It's a good looking watch. That price point, there's so much out there. Um, I, I would give this definitely a, a maybe. I know that they they have got legions of followers who buy, who love Norcane. I, I do like their their previous collections, but uh, I think the price point on this one probably because of Jean Claude Bivier's consultancy fee has pushed it up. <laughs> um, I think it's just a bit too much for the um, current people who are into Norcane at the moment. And as, and as Ripley says, there are other so many other manufacturers out there which you can buy. Same quality, even better, for less money. Yeah. Okay, okay. Oh, Alan Oops. has a point of order. Kevin, it's interesting what you said about the management fee. Because I've asked, <laughs> asked Jean-Claude Beaver and the chaps at Norcane. He really did that as a favor to them, as a friend, because he wanted to help them out. So... Oh, he got he gave them mates rates as opposed yes, to mates okay. rates. They paid them as a barter deal. They gave him watches, not the free one, but the wild one. Oh, right, just okay. No, I'm kidding. Okay. I'm kidding. But but it's interesting. It's it's steep pricing, but I think that's. Yes. Uh, I think they they still think they're brightling, so they think they yeah. can get away with it. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. But do you guys have buddies who actually own an, own a Norke? Yeah. I know a guy who who bought one. Yes. I do know one, yes. But he, he just bought it on a whim. He was like, well, you know, I've been thinking about this for a little bit. And then I went in there and just bought it and I like it. And I'm like, okay, that's great. Cool. Right. Well, final watch of the day. Let's up the quality somewhat with this. The Vacheron Constantin Overseas in Rose Gold. We're upping the gold content. We're upping the quality content. First question, general knowledge or general opinion, is the overseas the most underrated watch design currently from a major brand? Does this get the love that it really needs? I don't think it's underrated at $60,000. <laughs> it's, <pretty, laughs> it's pretty highly rated to me. <laughs> <laughs> Looks rated just fine yes. uh, to David. So this is a, a slew of new releases uh, that we've seen. Lots of gold, lots of jewels that will appeal uh, to David. The overseas, the multi uh, AMPM complication. Somewhere between 58,000 USD and nearly 80,000 USD for this collection. But how, gentlemen, will you vote? You can, you can pick which one you're voting on and I will ask you 
as we go around because there's a few watches here. So the count of three, hit, miss, or maybe. Couple of hits, rest is maybes. Right, David, which one are you giving a vote to? All of them are a maybe in my eyes because uh, all of them are on overseas. <laughs> And it's uh, it's interesting because I, I've been I've been like you know thinking about an overseas whether I like it or not whether I should aspire to own one someday because I like the overall concept uh, the the bezel the way the whole thing is is, is just done I, the concept is great but somehow the execution is very rarely spot on sometimes it's just like I want I feel like I want to like it more than I actually uh, end up liking these. Uh, Somehow it just never comes, very rarely comes together into a very coherent and, and, and beautiful piece. Even though it's full of cool details, somehow it just doesn't add up. And the day disc on that, on that chrono, I'm just looking at it, is, 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 is probably the, the worst thing I've seen <laughs> all week in watches. Look at that. Look at the font style. Look at, look at where yeah, it okay. is. Look, look at the way it is done. Oh my goodness. I got you. We, we, some of us may Whew. need to change our hip votes, but thankfully this wasn't the one I was thinking of when I, I gave it a I change it to a miss now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a particularly poor execution of a date disc now that I look at it. It's also, is it a different, no, is it at least a consistent font uh, with the rest of the watch, which is probably why it doesn't work, because it probably needed a thicker font of its own for the date disc. Alon, how did you vote? I don't know what's up with me. It's a maybe day for me. Usually I'm always skewed to the positive side of things and uh, giving uh, everything and everyone the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> um, obviously, a lot of people put this in the, 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 the Genta bracket, although it's not a Genta design. So this always uh, is, is mentioned in the same breath with the Nautilus and the uh, Royal Oak and uh, maybe the NG by IWC and, and it's up there. Um, I'm with David. I want to like it, and I've uh, I've many friends that have one, and I rock it when I see them. But it's not for me. Although I'll accept the Maltese cross from Patek, it's um, on steroids here. So they blew up the logo all over the watch. Um, I was happy the two 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 was back. So if I had to spend that money on a gold Vacheron, well, probably I'll go for a uh, leather strapped version but if i had to pick a full integrated bracelet gold one i would hands down go for a 222 so maybe like david i'm skewing to a, to a miss yeah good stuff uh kevin wow it's a hit for me all day long but only one particular model and that's the dual time yes the, the three hand oh, is just <laughs> awful that date at three o'clock and the chrono god what they can Kim. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah that that particular jewel i mean i have to say i i did pass on one last year for various reasons so um yeah that dual time is stunning for me that green is spectacular um cannot wait to see it um uh, get hands on again in the near future but it's just a work of art and it doesn't matter how much that well it does matter how much they charge for it but um it's it's beautiful. I mean, look at it. It's Kevin, may I ask right. you something? Go on. Does the crown or pusher on the four o'clock annoy yep. you? Does no. it tickle your OCD or does it do it for you? It does. It for I think me. that it does. Yeah, yeah. Would he, would you have liked it as a mono pusher vibe that it goes through the central crown? Possibly that would be a good touch. Yeah, different design. Absolutely. If somebody but, can do it. It's Russian, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, I'm I'm not fast. I just love that look of the AM PM indicator, and for once they've got rid of the um, the date disc. I mean, it just looks awful on the other two. I don't know why people buy those. That's the only one to get at the overseas. Full stop. Region Street Fifty Five. Watch out, Kevin is coming in hot today. <laughs> I, I think it, I gave it a hit because for this one, I think it's the best execution of asymmetry in any watch if you're not going to have a balanced crown setup a balanced dial setup this is what you should be modeling it after not the grand seikos not anything like this this is the best execution of asymmetry in in any watch that's why I Rick, give it a hit. when a brand Ooh. is yep. 
when a brand is has the same mother company like Panerai, do you give it an extra point? <laughs> Anything in Richemont always gets a positive vote. You know, I, I'm shilling for them on regular basis. I don't own this pan ride. This is just permanently loaned to me. I, 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 I have to, I have to bow at the, the, the altar of Richemont. Trying to stay like, in Panerai's good graces when he needs service, exactly. they'll take care of him. <laughs> <laughs> he just tells Ripley, the how, missus that that it's on permanent loan. That's what he says. Exactly. Uh, how did you vote, Ripley? Uh, I said it's a maybe. I've always liked the overseas. I think back in um, 2012, 13 or something like that, I was working for a gentleman and his father-in-law gave him an overseas chrono, stainless steel, uh, but it was the previous generation. So it had a lovely... Uh, date window at 12 o'clock versus that abomination that resides at the 430 location on this one. Um, I Like David said, that font looks absolutely ridiculous in there. It's not color matched. It, I mean, it really draws attention to itself. I, I said it's a maybe. You know, the dual time looks nice. These are obviously very expensive watches. So at this price point, you have a lot of options on the table. And um, conceptually, a green and gold watch isn't novel in any capacity i feel like this is like three or four years late to the party on that hype train but it's also very very nice at least the dual time is um so if you like what they're putting down at this price point yeah it's you know, it's a solid option but um the, the the it just feels a little bit unimaginative and if you do end up getting that chrono i don't know how you can move your eyes away from anything from that ridiculous like font on the white on black it, it looks like a little like an etch a sketch window or something like you know those little red things you if you shake the picture goes away it looks like one of those just kind of shoved under under the window there so it's a maybe for me but um yeah if someone gave me that dual time i'd happily wear it daily yeah good stuff well that is us for hit miss maybe this week thank you for tuning in if you're listening on the podcast or watching the edit at a blog to watch on YouTube. If you are tuning in to the live broadcast at a blog to watch weekly live, yeah, I know it's complicated, many channels, many choices, then you get to stick around for a little bit of extra time. But for everybody else, and that's my way of saying to everybody that's on the screen that you're still going to be live once you say goodbye. But for everybody else who's listening, I thank you for listening and see you again soon. Goodbye.